Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter Tide. If you've never heard of Easter Tide before, raise your hand. Thought so. Um, if you grew up in a mainline Christian tradition, Easter Tide is the time in the church calendar. is the 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and then Jesus' ascension into heaven. And then on the 50th day is Pentecost Sunday. And so we will celebrate that in 50 days as well. But Easter Tide is a season often that we often skip and forget. But it's really beautiful because it's an invitation for us to look inward and think about what is the meaning and purposes of Jesus' resurrection? What was Jesus' resurrected body like? But more than that, we thought we would begin this Easter Tide season with a series about a genderful God. And so what does that body look like? But what beyond Jesus' body resurrected? Who does God look like, right? What does God look like? And so that's how we're, we're starting this, this new season. When I think about um, what God looks like and things that have informed the way we think about God, I think of a story. Uh, my very first paid church job was as a youth pastor at an American Baptist church. And Pastor Greg was the senior pastor, and he would get up every Sunday and preach uh, on several different topics. But one particular Sunday, he, he got up and he told this story that I thought was interesting about how as a child when he was in church, uh, and then even as he got older into high school, he really liked to have long hair. And I mean, his hair like went down to his back. And the pastor would often cite passages in the Bible that talked about how it was a sin for men to have long hair. And so how men should not have that. And so one Sunday, he decided to, to harp on this particular sin. And he thought he would call Greg out in the service. And Jonathan, I'm going to use you for obvious reasons. And, and he, said, he said, you know, we like, we're friends. I can do this to you, right? right? Consent to this? Okay, good. And, and he looked at Greg and he said, Greg... You need to cut your hair. You need to repent and turn back to Jesus. You're living in sin. And Greg had had enough of this. So Greg stood up in church. You don't have to do that. And he pointed at this picture of Jesus just like this, this blonde hair, blue-eyed, very white Jesus on the back wall of the church. And he said, when that guy shaves his head or cuts his hair, I will. <laughs> and it just silenced the church. It just <laughs> fell. <laughs> You know, Greg never again was told to, cut, to cut his hair. And, and I think it's fascinating to think about how, how this is not what Jesus looked like. We just make that very clear, all right? Jesus was born in the Middle East, was not white, okay? Uh, just, that, was not, that is not ge- geographically possible. But this is what people created their image of who they thought God looked like because often we create images of God based on what we think or who we think or the social location that we, are, we grew up in that we're surrounded about. And so this was the image that they had created of Jesus. And they, what drives me crazy is that they didn't realize the hypocrisy and the inconsistency. That they said that, that it was a sin to have long hair and they cited these verses in the Bible, both the New Testament and the Old Testament. Yet the God that they had crafted their image after had long hair. The contradiction and how many contradictions exist like this in the world. The, these ideas and views and images we've created of God that, that truly actually don't actually totally line up. Now, now Neve, an expert in forensic facial reconstruction, just a few years ago, uh, this image came out. You may have seen it on social media or on the news of a, of a constructed image of what Jesus' face likely looked like by basically taking Semitic skulls from sort of Israeli archaeological sites and basically he used three particular things, three particular skulls to do computer x-ray ultrasounds and then taking that and anthropological, anthropological and genetic data and using that to come up with this image that this is what Jesus most likely looked like. It took these, these skulls were, were specifically found were the, in, the, in, the, in the neighborhood or community where Jesus was born. Reality is, is this doesn't look anything like what many of us in Western culture have been taught what Jesus looks like. Many of us have created images of God that just don't quite match up. What I think more than that is that the image of God has changed over the centuries. For instance, if you think about those whom our, our faith descends from within, within Judaism, they would not even say God's name because they didn't believe that there was a name or a gender that could ever even capture the expansiveness of who God was. Literally, all they would say is they would say Yahweh, but they would do it with breath. And they said, Yah. Yahweh stood for breath, that basically God was the very air we breathe, that God was breath, that God had given us life, and that was the closest thing that they could attribute to God. Yahweh. They, they didn't use that. They, they, they actually ended up using metaphors and images and, uh, that they would use to sort of describe maybe a glimpse of who God was, but, but never claiming that that was the expansiveness of who God was. 
It really wasn't until Christianity took its roots that we see the first manifestation of, of a human form of God in Jesus that, he, that Christianity begins to say, now this is likely what God looks like. God is a he. And God looks like X, Y, Z. But before that, there was a great mystery, there was a great uncertainty, there was a great expansiveness to who God was beyond the point that they wouldn't even give that God a name. They wouldn't even speak that God. The Jews still do this today. It's fascinating to think about the ways in which we and are, are raised in sort of fundamentalist circles, and particularly within Christian, Christian circles and Protestant circles, to have God figured all out, right? We have our theology, and we think we know who God is and how God works, and, and we have all the answers, and we can just make sense of it all. And I want you to think about this. If you think that your theology is so foolproof that you have answers to all the questions, and you have God all figured out, and you could even just make a nice little painting picture of exactly what God looks like, let me remind you, if you know all the answers and all the things that God does, you have made yourself a God. Because the God that has created us is so much more expansive and beyond what we could ever ask, think, believe, or imagine. And any moment that we think we've got God figured out, I think we've made ourselves gods. We cannot comprehend, but we can have small glimpses of the incomprehensible whole. Think about this for a moment. Um, uh, John Wesley, the founder of United Methodism, he came up with this concept, uh, if you've ever seen the United Methodist Church, John Wesley is the founders of the Methodist Church, called the Wesley Quadrilateral. And those of you who are in my sexual ethics group go, whoo, whoo. Yeah, you know this concept because we've been using this uh, in, our, in our sexual ethics group to sort of come up with uh, a, a holistic ethic. And so John Wesley believes that if you want to come up with a holistic worldview or ethic or ideas or beliefs, you must consider and draw from all four elements of this quadrilateral. But reality is, is most of us draw from one. It's something, whether that's the, the, the faith tradition that we grew up in or the household and family or cultural setting, we were taught and conditioned to think through one of these as the most important, maybe two in certain circumstances. So, for instance, if you grew up Roman Catholic, maybe um, you would be heavy in the tradition section. We've done this for hundreds of years. People have done this for a very long time. This is the way we do things. There's comfortability in knowing that this is the way it's always been done. And it's worked in the past, so it shall work in the future. So there's tradition. Now, if you grew up in um, historic mainline churches like Presbyterians or Episcopalians or United Church of Christ, United Methodists, things like this, often you're heavy in the reason camp, logic and science and being able to measure and touch and feel and experience things. You're often laying in the, the reason camp is that, is that group because they broke off, many of those traditions broke off from the Roman Catholic Church and were formed to create Protestantism. And so they, they sort of reasoned away when some of the things that the Catholics are doing don't make sense. And so they, they begin to reason in a different way and view that in a different lens. And then you have the, the scripture crew, many of you who are, grew up evangelical or non-denominational, the Bible says it, that settles it. I was hoping you would all say it with me together for you, those of you who grew up in it. And the Bible says so, right? And the Bible says that kind of preaching, right? And so that's all that you need to lean on is the Bible. Then for those of you who grew up in the experienced tradition, Pentecostal, charismatic, deconstructed folks often lean heavy on this experience element. Pentecostal charismatic folks would lean heavy in this and that like we go to these big retreats and these conferences and we have these kind of come down to the altar Holy Ghost moments and be baptized in the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues and have words of knowledge and prophecy of God speaking to us. So experience is heavy. Often if you grew up in that, you also lean heavy into scripture, but you get to dabble in this new sort of ex uh, uh, experience side, which makes you a little bit more holistic. You've got two sides of this instead of just one. That's great. You're making progress. And, and the deconstructed folks, obviously a lot of us in this church who are deconstructed lean, well, this is just what I feel. This is what I think. This is how I, this is that. And then maybe we disregard some of the other elements or we haven't figured out how to fully integrate them. Okay. So all four of these, in order to have a holistic, thought out, well-crafted worldview or ethic or belief or view of God, you must consider all of these things. That's the beauty of this church as being interdenominational. We have all of these in this church. And so because we have of that, we get to draw upon each other's experiences, upon each other's traditions and, and understandings of scripture, and upon each other's experiences to make sure that we have a holistic ideas and worldviews and opinions and isn't just insulated upon whatever tradition or background or, or, or experiences we've had. So, so think about that as we, as we write this. As we, as we write this, I thought about it as I wrote it. As you listen... Think about the ways in which you have been formed 
and maybe the ways you haven't been formed by not consulting some of these in your image of God. So I'm going to share with you a little bit of how I've been formed through my lens of these four areas as I've drawn from understanding a more expansive view of God. So from a scriptural lens, lens when I think about God, um, I, I sort of picture Jesus. That's sort of my default when I think of God. Um, and I think about that because of John chapter 1, where it says, the word, In the beginning was the Word, or the Word was first. The Word was present to God. God was present to the Word, meaning Christ or Jesus. Christ was God in readiness for God from day one. Everything was created through him. Nothing, not one thing, came into being without him. What I love about this John chapter 1 reading about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. In the beginning was the Word. Remember this? Maybe you knew that. Maybe you had to memorize it in Awanas or something, or, or Bible drills or, or, or sword drills in the charismatic church. Um, you remember that? Awana just takes you to triggers or good triggers, good things? Okay. <laughs> a little bit of both. Okay, a little bit of both. Um, and so there's this beauty in this passage to me that, that quite frankly, to be able to, to think about the fact that they're telling us in John chapter 1 that Jesus is the first manifestation of God, but reminding us, nevertheless, and actually wasn't just the beginning. Just the first manifestation of God in a physical human form that we could wrap our minds around in a way that felt more tangible. But guess what? John 1's telling us God was always around, manifesting in so many different ways beyond what you could even think or feel or imagine. You just are clinging to this thing because it's most familiar. But God, Jesus, was always around in all those different ways but different manifestations. Further than that, going all the way back, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 when they're in the beginning of creation, it says, then God said, let us, notice that, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. That's in all of your Bibles. That's not like Josh's translation or like, like next 500 years progressive translation. Like that's none of that. That's in all of your Bibles. That literally in the beginning of creation, sometimes we miss that. It literally says, God does not refer to God's self as he, let, that he created in our image or she. It says us. It said that God said to create humans in our image. God referred to God's self in the they nature, not a gendered nature in the beginning. And even, our, or even if you would say that God did not write this or this didn't come from the mouth of God, our Jewish ancestors from a deep, rich tradition, they never understood God as one gender. They understood God as much more expansive beyond that that could not be contained to one gender, referring to God as our and they and us to me, when I look into that scriptural lens, I see this sort of expansiveness of God from long stretch throughout Christian history in scripture. You may have heard me pray before at the ends of my sermon. Sometimes I'll say, in the name of the Holy Parent, the Holy Child, and the Holy Spirit. And I often refer to God as Holy Parent because I think it's important for us to, to stop and try to capture the fact that sometimes... Um, the, the whole intention of Jesus' original prayer of, of thou Father who art in heaven, it, it wasn't necessary to say, I, I don't believe, that, that, that God was a father or God was a man, but instead was inviting them to see God in a more intimate way. Because remember, to those early Jewish hearers, they would not have given God a name. They would have not have said God's name. And so then to be invited to call God Father in a prayer, intimate. Now, if Austin and I ever have kids one day, um, one of the beautiful, beautiful things is, is, is that we're both going to be, we're both going to be father, we're both going to be dad, we're going to be daddy. I don't know what they're going to call us. You know, they're gonna, we haven't figured it out. But <laughs> we're going to have that. But reality is, our, our child likely will not know a mother. And so, growing up, for me, I want them to be able to just identify with the concept of parent, not mother or father or any of those types of uh, differences. But just that, that there are two people in this world that love you and care for you really, really much that are raising you, that you can rely on. That's all Jesus was, 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 was saying to the, world, to, 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 to the disciples. You have somebody in this world who loves and cares about you and crafted this world after you and for you and that you reflect and you were made it in that person's image. That's all that there was an invitation to see. As a teen, I, I really struggled with uh, understanding my masculinity um, as a gay man. And Jesus really helped me see that in a new way, my masculinity. Um, uh, we'll be inviting uh, Sarah New to preach to us in this series about the they nature of God, and Reverend Vanetta will be preaching about the she nature of God. And, and I'm excited for that. And so today, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the he nature of God and why it matters and has been important to me. Um, I can remember when I was in, I think it was middle school or high school, I can't remember the exact age, but I, I wore pink a lot. And I remember confiding in the music pastor at my church that I really liked wearing pink, but that I was also, like, gay. 
and <clears throat> like gay, like just dabbling. And he said, well, why do you wear pink if, you, if, you, if you're struggling with your sexuality? And, he's, and I'm like, what? I don't understand. Like, that's the follow-up question? And he said, don't you think that it, that it makes you struggle with your sexuality more and, like, want to give in to your inclinations to be with men by wearing pink? I'm like, I'm, I'm not tracking with you. Like, I need you to, like, help me. Like, draw a map. And so he basically said, he's like, if you wear pink, it's going to make you feel more effeminate, and it'll make you feel more like giving into those inclinations. But if you wore darker colors, it'll make you feel more masculine and not make you want to give into those inclinations. I'm like, wow, who came up with that? That's... <laughs> And I was very susceptible as a middle school and high school kid. To, I mean, I went through reparative therapy. I'd listened to my pastors. I had deeper admiration. But this one thing, I was like, that just doesn't seem normal. or doesn't seem right. It doesn't make sense to me. And so I invested in a real men wear pink t-shirt and sported that thing around. It would not give up my bright colors. As a, as a kid, I, I really wrestled with trying to figure out, like, what made me masculine? And who could I look to in the social circles that I was in, in the world I was in, that could show me what it looked like to be masculine, that, that wasn't weird, toxic masculinity versions of being masculine? I'm going to re- recommend this, this book to you, Jesus and John Wayne, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith, Fractured a Nation. And, and it's, about, it's about, really about toxic masculinity and, and how it really caused great harm in our country and to our faith. Um, and it's a historical read of it, but also a very analytical, theological read. Excellent read if on the train. That's where I'm reading it. Um, and, and I encourage you to read that if you're wanting to dig into that more and, and explore some of that. But I, one of the things that was most healing to me as I sort of tried to figure out my faith and my sexuality and, and as well as my masculinity was that Jesus did not measure up to be the things that I was being told was a masculine thing. I was going to be committed to singleness and celibacy for my life, and that meant I was never going to have kids, and I was never going to have a a wife or get married. And I was told that was the end-all, be-all. That's what everybody was working towards. And I wasn't going to be as masculine if I didn't have those things. And it was deeply comforting comforting to me to be able to look at Jesus and say, he never got married, and he never had kids, and no one's ever questioned Jesus' masculinity. It was deeply comforting for me to be able to look at the life of Jesus and think that, you know, while, while, while society at the time and society today promotes this idea of, of sort of like this over-realized complex, uh, protector complex that we have to defend uh, our, our women or we have to defend ourselves through physical violence and not allow people to, to, to uh, offend us or to, to harm us, it was amazing for me to be able to step back and think, well, you know, I can't think of times when Jesus resorted to violence to sort of save face or save character or defend himself. Actually, he does the opposite with Peter. When Peter does it and cuts someone's ear off, he heals it and makes it well again. And while I was being told that a true man doesn't let a kid punch him, another guy punch him in school, you need to fight back, I had to think, you know, I know that's what you're telling me a masculine person would do, but that's not what I want to do, and that's not what I believe Jesus calls me to, and that's who I model my masculinity after. Jesus has been, and probably forever will be, the greatest example for me of what it looks like to be um, in my flesh, in my body, and how I want to embody myself in the world, regardless of my gender. I think it's important for us to consider this um, and the ways in which there's complexities to all of this. I want us to to dive in a little bit more as well and and think through, um, that's from a traditional lens of of maybe how some of us think and view and understand God. Uh, I want us to also think about, um, there are many different manifestations of God throughout scripture. We see God manifest through people, through audible voices, through huge handwritings on walls, through dreams and visions, through human form, through burning bushes bushes and pillars of smoke and a donkey, I love that. Um, Wind, like that, that there's, we, we don't know, you know, obviously some of us, we think it's metaphorical language or we're not fully sure if like that physically happen, but what matters is this is, if we want to lean heavy into tradition, our Judeo brothers and sisters and kinfolk, quite frankly, they used these images to help us see God more clearly or in unique ways, because they knew that God was more expansive than any of the words and palatable metaphors that we would have ever been able to understand, but God was even bigger than that. From a reasoning mindset, if we want to draw from the reasoning point of the Wesley quadrilateral, God is bigger than any one gender, metaphor, description, God is not limited nor never was limited to just the body of Jesus. And guess what? God transcends gender. Jesus is just one manifestation of many manifestations of God in the Trinity. And I think the Trinity was a concept we created to limit God, but I think God goes beyond just even the Trinity. 
If God is one thing, God, God, that doesn't mean that God can't be another thing. If God can be light and is in the light, I also believe God is in the dark. If God can manifest as a pillar of fire, God can also manifest as wind or burning bushes. If God can be present at creation, God can also be present around creation and through creation and in creation. If God can be male, I believe God can also be female or non-conforming. If God can be genderful, God could also be genderless. God is not and never was limited to manifesting God's self through one place in time in history or through one structure or through one scripture or one person. So if God is bigger than all of these, is it possible that God is so much bigger that God cannot be contained by one gender or human words, boxes, or constructs? I think so. I think it is possible. When I think about the ways uh, uh, that, that, that gender is often, masculinity is often defined by social structures. I think of this research done by a gender identity protection uh, by Family Research Council reported back in July 2020. It said that Aka men of the Central African Republic and Republic of Congo, they are expected to be nurturing and gentle and spend more time holding their children than any other person or any other society in the world. Now, if I think about, like, how caring and nurturing and loving that is, that, that's comforting for me because when I think about being a father one day, I, if the, how I care for my plants are any sign for how I'll take care of my kids, <laughs> I will for sure overwater them. Like, I will, I will over-nurture. I'll have to rein myself in. I'm a plant daddy. That's right. There's this beautiful image that I want us to think about that sometimes I wonder if God manifests God's self through Jesus as a male, not because God is primarily male, but catch me with this. And if you catch nothing else, maybe catch this. But maybe God manifested because it was men of the day, both past and present, who needed an example of the most tender, loving, caring male figure who wouldn't turn little children away when they wanted to come and sit on his lap. Maybe God manifested as a man, not because men were at the top of the food chain, because it, but because it was men who needed most an example of a tender, loving man in the world because men held the power and men still often hold the power. Maybe Jesus came to show what it looked like for a man to relinquish some power. Cultural masculinity is limited and always changing and biblical masculinity is also diverse and full. Austin Hartke says this in his book that I think is really a beautiful capture of the reality that we live in that nor biblical masculinity nor cultural masculinity will ever be able to define or capture what masculinity is. Just like no book, no author, no time in history can ever truly capture the expansiveness of who God is. For God is beyond all of those things. So in this series, we want to invite you. We want to invite you over the next couple of weeks to see God beyond your sort of cultural or biblical or masculine lenses to change over time to realize that our understanding of God has evolved and your understanding of God can continue to evolve as well. But instead, let us invite ourselves to see a broader lens, one that draws from both scripture, from tradition, from reason, and from our experiences. And if you give one of those heavier weight than the other, maybe spend some time in another part of that quadrilateral. Maybe spend another time talking to somebody else in your social circles who grew up in a different tradition that can help you expand that view and that understanding. Because I think if we want to have a holistic views, we must draw from all. So as we get ready to end the sermon, I want to invite you to take your phones out if you want, and, or if you have them. And I want to take a picture of the questions that are on the screen. Because 30 seconds that I'm about to read this will not give you enough time to sit with it and give it a true answer that it deserves. But this week, and over the next few weeks of the series, I want you to ask these questions to yourself. I want you to consider them. I want you to look deep as you explore the possibilities that maybe God is beyond the images that you've been shown or told. So who are we limiting in their ability to see God because of how we see God? When do we hold on to traditional ideas of God and when do we let them go? When do we plan ourselves by the river of truth and when do we admit that for now we only see through a glass dimly? How have your traditions, your experiences, your understanding of scripture and the way that you reason formed the way that you see God. I think if we spend the next few weeks asking those questions, digging deep, looking underneath the surface, learning from one another and our own experiences and traditions, I think we'll see a more expansive view of God that won't even just help us see God better. It'll help you see yourselves better. For you were created in God's image 
and it will help you love one another better, for we all were created in God's image, this diverse representation of the body of Christ.